Well, I want to start by thanking Shafi for that very generous introduction and for inviting me here today to speak to all of you. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor, for, particularly for an economist, to be speaking at the, uh, the Simons Institute, uh, and uh, particularly about uh, uh, computing. Uh, especially to be talking about computing in front of a Turing Award winner, it's actually quite intimidating. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep my comments relatively low level and broad, rather than to focus on any kind of detailed mathematical derivations. Uh, I know that being from MIT, we have a rule that says every PowerPoint deck has to have at least one equation. I'm going to break that rule today. There will be no <laughs> equations. Uh, but this is a public lecture after all. So I'm assuming that not everybody here uh, is well versed in the theory of computing. What I'm going to talk about instead is how artificial intelligence has really changed the way we think about financial technology and what that implies for the future of the field. There are some really interesting implications, some troubling concerns that I want to bring to your attention and hopefully a way out that I'm, I'm uh, betting that people in this audience will be able to implement over the course of the next few years. Uh, so that's a, a quick outline of what I'm going to try to touch on. And, uh, but uh, feel free to interrupt with questions or comments. I know there's a Q&A period at the end, uh, but happy to take uh, questions earlier uh, if you like. Generally, people are a little too polite to do that, but um, I would encourage you nonetheless. I want to start with. So I'm actually using the lapel mic as opposed to this one. So I'm hoping that, is this, is this better? Yes. OK, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, should I, I hope I don't have to repeat what I uh, just said? No. OK. All right. Well, so I want to start with a little bit of motivation. And the motivation is this graph. And the graph looks like this. Anybody tell me what this graph is? Climate change. Climate change? <laughs> uh, that, hopefully not, but I understand where you're coming from. Exactly. This hockey stick is world population from 10,000 BC to the present. And it is the prototypical hockey stick because population growth happens to be exponential. But there are very few species on this planet that actually have a growth curve that looks like this. You know, I grew up in New York City. And during long, hot summers, occasionally the population of cockroaches in New York look like this. And then you call the exterminator, and boom, it comes back down. Homo sapiens have been reproducing virtually unchecked for eons. How? How do we do this? And the answer, of course, happens to be technology. Technology is what enables us to really dominate virtually every ecosystem on this planet agricultural technology, medical technology, manufacturing technology, and so on. And it's actually easy to see this if you look at it on a logarithmic scale. Because on a log scale, the slopes can tell you the rate of growth. And from this log scale depiction, you can tell that there are maybe four or five different unique periods in human evolution. The flat part of the curve to the left is the Stone Age. And then the slight upward curving part, that's the Bronze Age. And then after that, the Iron Age, and then the Industrial Age. And over the course of the last 100 years, we are in what I think of as the Digital Age. Between 1900 and 2019, we have nearly quintupled the number of people walking this planet. That is an extraordinary amount of growth. In, from an evolutionary time scale in a blink of an eye. And it is because of all these different technologies, most important of all for the current discussion is digital technology. And so you all know by now Moore's Law better than I do, the fact that we are doubling the capacity of chips uh, every three to five years. My colleagues in the physics and engineering departments at MIT tell me that we're actually running up on a limit to Moore's law. Uh, and that may be the case, but then there's quantum computing, and who knows what that will do in terms of being able to keep this pushing forward. And you might think that because of progress on the tech side, there has to be an implication in financial services. And the answer is there is. There is a financial Moore's law. And 
if we take a look at what that looks like, let's take, I don't know, trading volume as a case in point. The red line here is the amount of trading for options and futures on various different exchanges. And what you can see is that if you do a log scale, which is the uh, blue line, and the green line is the uh, linear curve that you fit, we're doubling average daily trading volume of financial securities about once every seven or eight years. It's not quite the same as Moore's Law, but it is just as impressive. And so it's pretty clear that financial technology is going through an incredible growth spurt. And many of you, I suspect, know this firsthand because you're probably in the fintech space. How many people here are actually working on fintech startups or have an idea to do something along those lines? Show of hands. All right. Fair number. How many of you here are actually very concerned about fintech and what it might do to society? Yeah, good. So you're at the right place. We're going to talk about both the positives and the potential negatives of this uh, set of amazing innovations. But I want to give you one example of what an innovation in financial technology might mean for each one of you in the audience here. And that technology is what I'm going to call precision indexes. Now, you've all heard about precision medicine. E Oops. Uh, you've all heard about precision medicine, the idea that you can actually target therapies specific to your particular genetic makeup. In cancer, it is absolutely critical to get your DNA sequence before a doctor will even talk with you about treatment options because it has become so oriented towards customizing it for particular individuals. What about if we did that for financial products and services? So you know, instead of the Dow Jones 30, the FTSE 100, or the S&P 500, imagine being able to have the Shafi Goldwasser 30 or the Peter Bartlett 100 or the Jim Simons 500. An index specifically for you that's focused on your income, expenses, age, health, taxes, behavior, life goals, constraints, everything about you so that we can design exactly the right portfolio for you every day. And imagine that this is really smart beta in that it is totally automated. Now, it turns out that we now have the means to do this. We've got the hardware. We've got the software. We've got the telecommunications platforms. And this is within our grasp. Now, this is not a new idea by any means. A number of years ago, there was a paper published titled Personal Indexes. And the, the concluding paragraph had this to say about technology. Artificial intelligence and active management are not at odds with indexation, but instead imply a more sophisticated set of indexes and portfolio management policies for the typical investor, something each of us can look forward to perhaps within the next decade. Who was this incredibly prescient, insightful sage that wrote these words? Well, it was written by yours truly. Uh, but I wrote this in 2001. And so one could argue that given that we don't have precision indexes yet, that I was off because it's been a lot more than a decade. Now, I wasn't totally wrong in the sense that we do have robo-advisors <clears throat> and ETFs and mutual funds that have all sorts of automated algorithms that provide investors with exposure to different kinds of styles of investing. But we're not there yet. And the question I want to take up today is, why not? What's missing? And it turns out that it is not artificial intelligence that's missing. What we don't have is what one of my graduate students called artificial stupidity. We don't have an algorithmic understanding of how people actually behave. We have all sorts of rules and heuristics about how people should behave. But we don't actually know, algorithmically, how people do behave. And that's what we need before we can actually design truly useful, highly customized precision indexes. Now, I think artificial stupidity is a bit uh, strong and obnoxious. 
So I would change it to artificial humanity because all of us, we make mistakes. And it's not necessarily even a bad thing because some of those mistakes can actually save us in other contexts. So what we need are algorithms that actually describe human behavior so we can counterbalance the least productive actions with various different kinds of remedies. And that's the missing link, human behavior, not understanding that human behavior can overwhelm all of the most sophisticated technological advances. To cite that other famous philosopher and great humanitarian, Darth Vader, uh, when, uh, sorry for that, I, I teach MBA students, so I have to incorporate sound effects into my, uh, when, when, you, when you are looking at all of these sophisticated technologies, it turns out that they don't, they, they don't have any uh, ability uh, to deal with overwhelming human behavior, particularly during crises. So what I want to do now is to talk about how do we model human behavior, because it turns out that the way we model it is going to give us some insight into the kind of AI, the new AI, that's going to be necessary to deal with these opportunities and uh, challenges. So I want to begin with my own field of economics and talk about the theory of economic behavior. How do economists think about the way people, particularly investors, behave? And in order to do that, I'm going to take you back to 1947, which is the year that Paul Samuelson published his PhD thesis titled, very modestly, Foundations of Economic Analysis. Now remember, he was a PhD student. <laughs> It turned out it was modest because his PhD thesis actually became the foundations of modern economic analysis. At the same time, von Neumann and Morgan Stern at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton published a book on the theory of games and economic behavior. And these two works described a particular paradigm known as expected utility theory. The idea that each of us, we have these utility functions, a measure of our happiness. And the way that we can predict how humans behave is to maximize the expected utility subject to budget constraints and other practical production and, and consumption constraints. And that will predict how it is that people behave. This theory became so successful in academic economics that economists emboldened by the beauty of the mathematical precision with which you can calculate these kinds of solutions, they started applying it to all sorts of other domains that had nothing to do with economics. Things like a theory of divorce, of suicide, of extramarital affairs. And so it got to the point where the theory of economic behavior started becoming the economic theory of all behavior. And the term homo economicus arose. This idea of economic humans, that people actually behave in ways that are much more akin to what economists think than other disciplines. So you might not be surprised to learn that after these theories were espoused, people tested them. And the tests had mixed results. Initially, it looked like it worked pretty well. It certainly can predict certain kinds of behavior. But the more you applied these tests to various different domains, the more it became clear that actually they don't fit the data very well. When I was a grad student and an assistant professor, I worked with a colleague, Craig McKinley, to test the random walk hypothesis, which is one aspect of, of this theory of expected utility maximization. And what we found was that in the data, the random walk does not hold for stock prices. You could actually predict stock prices to some degree. Little did we know that at the time we were writing this paper, uh, a, a certain mathematician was applying these ideas in trying to predict the stock market. Uh, that mathematician um, uh, is now a multi-billionaire, and he happens to be the, uh, the founder of the Simons uh, Institute for uh, the Theory of Computing. So we know, we know from Jim Simons' work that actually the random walk doesn't hold. But a number of economists and psychologists came up with all sorts of other behavioral biases that humans seem to suffer from. And I won't take you through all of them, but I'll give you a, a very simple example that I think we all face every day in terms of how we decide on investing. My first year MBA students are confronted with this problem uh, in the class that I teach. 
and try to motivate how to think about investing, I show them the returns of four different financial assets. I don't tell them what that is or even over what time period they span. Uh, I simply show them what the rates of return are for a dollar invested in these four assets over an unspecified multi-year horizon. And this is what it looks like. The green line turns a dollar into two dollars over this multi-year investment period. Not very rewarding, but not particularly risky. It's got a pretty smooth upward slope. Red line turns a dollar into about five dollars, way more rewarding, but way more volatile. Lots more risk. The, uh, Blue line turns a dollar into eight dollars, even more rewarding, but way more volatile, and the black line somewhere in between. And the question that I ask them is, if you could only pick one of these four assets, you can't mix and match them, you can only pick one to put your entire, your entire retirement wealth or your children's college fund or your, your parents' or grandparents' life savings, if you could only choose one of these, which would you pick? It's a matter of risk versus reward, right? So how many of you here would pick the uh, green line, show of hands? Anybody? Wow, nobody? Well, maybe one person, but OK. How about the red line? Anybody, any takers for the red line? Really? Only one person? For, I want you to remember this moment, because when I tell you what the red line is, some of you are going to need to call your brokers. <laughs> the, um, the blue line, any takers for the blue line? OK, so these are the uh, entrepreneurs and hedge fund managers. Yeah? Do I see the graph? What's that? Do I see the graph, right? You see the graph? Like, that I made this call. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You see this whole thing right now. And I'm asking you right now. Yeah, you see the graph. Do you like that? OK. Black line. How many people want black? Yeah. <laughs> Virtually all the audiences that I've talked to way prefer the black line. Why? Because it's got the best trade off between risk and reward. It's not the most rewarding, but it seems to have pretty low risk. Well, let me tell you what you all picked. First of all, the time period goes from 1990 to 2008. Okay. <laughs> the green line is US Treasury bills, the safest asset in the world, at least for the first, next few weeks. We'll see what happens with the <laughs> budget discussions. But not very rewarding. So if you put your money in T-bills, you would have earned pretty much next to nothing over the course of the last decade. The red line, which only one of you picked, that's the S&P 500, the US stock market. Most of you already have that in your 401k. So if you didn't pick it, you need some rebalancing to do. But if you did pick it in 2008, congratulations, you did just fine. You did quite well. The blue line is a single company, Pfizer. Pharmaceutical company, way, way, way more risky. Not for everybody, but for the few entrepreneurs uh, and hedge fund uh, protégés, makes sense. And if you put your money in Pfizer, well, congratulations, you did even better. Exactly. <laughs> Phenomenal. Now what about for the most of you who picked the black line? The black line is the return to a private fund known as the Fairfield Century Fund. This was the feeder fund for the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. <laughs> Which is why I had to stop it in 2008. That's when the Ponzi scheme blew up. Now you know how the Ponzi scheme got as big as it did. Look at the number of hands that went up. It is human nature that we are all drawn like a moth to a flame to high yielding, low risk assets. And in finance, we have a term to capture that phenomenon. It's called the Sharpe Ratio. The Sharpe Ratio is defined as the expected return above and beyond T-bills in the numerator and risk as measured by the volatility in the denominator. So what you can think of it is the amount you're earning per unit risk. And we all want more. We want more Sharpe Ratio, higher Sharpe Ratios. And if you look at Pfizer, and the S&P 500, the Sharpe ratios are about a third compared to the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme before it blew up. It had a Sharpe ratio on paper that was an order of magnitude higher. Sometimes when things are too good to be true, they, they aren't true. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing patently irrational about seeking high Sharpe ratio assets. 
But the problem is that our perception of risk is highly subjective and context dependent and can easily be manipulated. And as a result, human behavior does not always give us the best financial outcomes. But unless we understand why we do the things that we will later regret, we can't develop the algorithms to get around it and to do a better job. That is, after all, what AI is supposed to be about. It's about doing a better job than what we can do ourselves or to do it faster, cheaper, on a more broadly distributed scale. So we want, we want to focus on that. How do we do that? How do we design a theory of actual behavior as opposed to a theory of what we think people ought to be doing? The answer actually was, was uh, first proposed by a computer scientist of a sort. And that computer scientist is named Herbert Simon. Now, before Simon became a computer scientist, and I'm not really sure that computer scientists really feel that he's a computer scientist, before that, he was an economist. And he came up with a theory of behavior that he called bounded rationality. In 1956, Simon's proposed something that he called satisficing behavior. That word satisficing doesn't exist in the English language. He made it up as a combination of satisfactory uh, and optimizing behavior. It was a compromise. And his notion was that humans, we don't optimize. We don't have a utility function that we're trying to use the calculus of variations to compute optimal investment trajectories. We come up with rules of thumb, heuristics. We have a mental model. The mental model has a particular prediction, and we follow that prediction. And when we're wrong, well, so be it. And so Simon's proposed satisficing as an alternative to expect the utility maximization. And as a result, he became totally alienated from the economics profession. Now, let me explain to you why that is. To do that, I have to sort of explain what the theory of satisficing is. So I'm going to give you an example of coming up with a, a heuristic. The example has to do with a particular problem that all of us face every day, and that is getting dressed in the morning. What should you wear? So I'm going to tell you how I work with my particular uh, challenge by telling you first what my wardrobe looks like. So here's my wardrobe. I've got five jackets, 10 pairs of pants, 20 ties, 10 shirts, 10 pairs of socks, four pairs of shoes, and five belts. That's my entire wardrobe. Now, you might think that's a rather limited collection of clothing. But I'll have you know that if you calculate the combinatorics, you'll see that I have 2 million unique outfits in my closet. 2 million unique outfits. Now, it's true. Not all of them are equally compelling from a fashion perspective. <laughs> so I have a problem. I have to choose the best outfit. How do I do that? Well, suppose that I optimized I tried to calculate the expected utility across all of these different outfits. And let's assume that it takes me one second to evaluate the fashion content of an outfit. How long would it take me to go through all possible outfits to see whether or not I've got just the right one? It turns out it'll take 23.1 days. Now, you could say, well, maybe you'll do it once, and then you're done, and you don't have to do it ever again. I promise you, I have never spent 23.1 days, ever, <laughs> thinking about what to wear in the morning. How do we do that? Yeah? I think you're off by a factor of two. <laughs> really? Yeah, you're assuming your socks match. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Busted. That tells me more about you than it does about the problem. <laughs> that. that you are a very creative individual that does not care about socks matching. Yeah, thank you. Very good. So it turns out that, in fact, we don't optimize according to Simon's. We come up with rules of thumb that are good enough. And by the way, you know sort of what these rules of thumb are, right? Like, you're not supposed to wear white slacks after September. Who said that? Well, my wife told me that. that that's a rule. Or, you know, you shouldn't wear shorts to a, a wedding. Uh, we sort of know that. We come up with different rules of thumb, and that's how we get by. 
Simons proposed this, and he was roundly criticized by his economic colleagues in the following way. So the idea behind satisficing is you come up with an algorithm that's good enough. It's satisfactory. It's not perfect. It's good enough. Well, what does that mean? Well, presumably, it means that the cost of optimizing is going to be balanced against the benefit of finding a better solution, right? But let's think about that for a minute. Good enough means close enough to optimal, which means that the cost of doing another optimization is not really commensurate with the reward. But how do you know that unless you know what the optimum is? When I got dressed this morning for this event today, I didn't spend the 23.1 days. So you know, I might have been able to come up with just the right outfit that would make my, all of my remarks so much more compelling that you would go off and be totally convinced that what I was saying was the God's truth. How do I know that if I didn't spend the time doing it, that the solution that I did come up with was good enough? And if you do know what the optimal solution is, <laughs> then you don't need to satisfy. Just do the optimal thing, right? So, so satisficing was dismissed. And actually, eventually, uh, Simon, who was at Carnegie Mellon at the time, left the economics department and moved over into psychology and computer science. And by the way, his work in computer science was absolutely re revolutionary for computer science. He was the first to study algorithmic methods for playing chess. And he and Alan Newell developed some really advanced ideas about how to come up with a chess playing program. It wasn't as good as the programs we have today, but based upon what they were working with, was really pathbreaking. And in recognition of his work in AI, he was awarded the Turing Medal, the highest honor in computer science. And Simon also won the Nobel Prize in economics. He's the only person to have won both of those awards. And it's astonishing that his work has not had much impact in economics, given how important I think it is, and many others now, that recognize what he's done. It wasn't until I started thinking about it from an evolutionary perspective that I finally came up with a response to Simon's critics. And the response that I've come up with and written about is this. We don't know whether something is good enough. What we do is to do what we can right now, and we use that heuristic until and unless we have another reason to come up with a better one. So quick example, when I was a, a, a five-year-old growing up in New York, some uh, marketing genius figured out that Superman was the hero of the day, so you could sell a lot of Superman jackets to five-year-olds if you put them emblems on uh, the uh, jeans jackets. And so they offered that. I saw it on TV. I told my mom I wanted this. Could I have a Superman jacket? And she said, no. You know, we were a single parent household. We couldn't afford it. It was a luxury. And uh, so that was it. I asked her the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And for about two months, I asked her every day, can I have it now? How about now? Can I combine it with my birthday and Christmas present? I nagged her endlessly as most five-year-olds will do, until finally she relented. And I remember the day that she agreed to buy it. It was a Friday after work. We went to Alexander's on Queens Boulevard in, uh, in Queens, New York. Got the jacket, put it on, wore it, slept in it. Did not take it off for the entire weekend, uh, except when I had to take a bath. And she forced me. She would not let me wear it in the bathtub. And come Monday morning, I was so excited to get the jacket on and wear it for school. I posed in front of the mirror, got up early, and looked at myself, and I spent so much time in the mirror, I was late for school. <laughs> and that was the first time, as a first grader, I was late for school. And it was pretty traumatic, uh, because in those days, you had to go to the principal's office, and get a note from the principal, bring it back to the teacher. And I remember walking to the back of the room where everybody was already working on their lessons, snickering that I was late. And it was so traumatizing that over five decades later, I still remember that day as if it were yesterday. From that day forward, it did not take me any longer than three minutes to get dressed for school. And that heuristic, the heuristic that I came up with, came about because I had a bad experience. 
So the negative emotional reaction that I got forced me to come up with a new heuristic. And that heuristic worked quite well until I got to college. And my roommate asked me to be best man for his wedding. And at the wedding rehearsal, I showed up in shorts because I figured it was a rehearsal, not realizing that actually you're supposed to wear like the whole thing, the tux and all that. So heuristics are developed in response to the environment. We adapt. And so this idea of bounded rationality requires a new theory of human behavior, homo aptum, the adaptive human. So this is where I have the adaptive markets hypothesis come into play. Uh, the great uh, evolutionary biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky said that nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. I would paraphrase that to say that nothing makes sense in the financial industry except in light of adaptive markets. The idea being that we make mistakes, but we adapt and we change, and market dynamics are really driven by that evolutionary process. So now let me bring this back to artificial intelligence and contrast that with natural intelligence in the context of adaptation. And I think you'll see where we're going with this and what it has to do with fintech. So to talk about the relationship between AI and natural intelligence and bounded rationality, I want to use an example of a piece of AI that is incredibly effective. It has to do with recommender systems. So recently, I got interested in biotech. So I decided that I needed to learn more about the industry. So I wanted to order a book on uh, one of the most successful biotech companies in the history, uh, Genentech. And so I went to Amazon, like many of you would do, and I searched for Genentech, and I got this book. And I clicked Add to my shopping basket. And as soon as I did that, Amazon does this really nasty, obnoxious thing that I just hate. It showed me five other books that other people who bought this book also bought. And sure enough, I had to buy two more. <laughs> really, really nasty habit. This is new AI. Now, I know that many of you are young enough that you don't even understand the distinction between new AI and old AI. But there was such a thing called old AI. Let me tell you what that was. Old AI was expert systems, something that was pioneered by actually a Stanford faculty, Edward Feigenbaum, and one of my colleagues at MIT, Randy Davis. It was a, a system of basically rules that were meant to capture optimal behavior in various different scenarios. So an expert system was meant to be an exhaustive enumeration of all possible scenarios that you might find yourself in, and then the selection of the optimal behavior in exactly that particular scenario. So in those days, storage was very expensive. And so the programming had to be incredibly efficient. The coding was really critical. The algorithm was incredibly sophisticated. Not a lot of data, not a lot of storage possibilities. That's exactly the opposite of new AI. So it turns out that what I call new AI, and recommender systems is one example, the algorithms are actually pretty simple. What's complex is the data. And it turns out that new AI <coughs> is a lot closer to natural intelligence, as far as we understand it, as far as neuroscientists tell us, than old AI. Old AI is actually much closer to homo economicus. Let's figure out the optimal rules for various different scenarios, and let's do that. That's not how people behave. People behave with bounded rationality. In case you're interested, a couple of years ago, there was a really neat review paper published on the Amazon recommender system. And they acknowledge that the early version was actually pretty simple. They've gotten some more sophisticated versions since then. But the early version that worked pretty well, and obviously made Amazon what it is today, uh, it is remarkably effective. But it really started to work well when they got enough data. So data is key. So I want to talk a bit about that. And I want to talk about it in the human context. I want to talk about something that all of us have already been adapted to doing. And that is threat identification. I'm going to show you a picture. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. But I want you to tell me as quickly as possible, just shout it out, whether or not this picture is friend or foe. Does it represent any kind of a threat? Or is it benign? OK, you ready? All right, here we go. Friend or foe? Foe. 
you know, I'm getting both because basically, who knows? What is it? It's just a bunch of random pixels. You can't really tell. Not enough data. By the way, the correct biological answer is faux. What you don't know can kill you. So from an evolutionary perspective, you should be afraid of this. But we are much more rational today, so we don't know. All right, let me give you the same picture, but with a few more pixels. Friend or foe? Whoa. It's looking pretty threatening, right? OK. One more picture. Friend or foe? So this is a selfie of yours truly at the Washington, D.C. Spy Museum getting stalked by a ninja. But in fact, it's not a real ninja. It's pretty clear. This is obviously not threatening at all. So threat identification is something that we can do instinctively, but only if we have enough data. Right? Data is critical. All right, so let me give you a more complex. This is a very simple example. I'm going to give you a more complex example. The next example has to do also with friend or foe, but this has to do with something that all of us have done. We've gone to cocktail parties where we've met lots of different people. And during the course of the evening, you'll find out different things about different people you run into. And you may or may not have a goal, but let's suppose that you're trying to figure out who you might want to work with or who you might like to be friends with. So you want to learn whether or not you're compatible with these various different individuals. In particular, you might learn over the course of an evening's conversation about their gender, sexual orientation, marital status, race, ethnicity, age group, so on and so forth. Okay? So, I'm going to tell you about two particular individuals that you will run into in this course of a hypothetical evening. And I'm going to ask you to make three decisions about these two individuals. So the two individuals are Jose and Susan. And let me first tell you about Jose. Jose is a gay Latino male, uh, single, young professional from California who's a no religious affiliation, a Democrat, middle class with an MBA. Now let me tell you about Susan. Susan is a heterosexual, married, female, uh, white, middle-aged, from Texas, Christian, Republican, affluent, with a bachelor's degree. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you to make three decisions about Jose and Susan. Decision number one, you're about to launch a tech startup, and you need to hire somebody to help you with the business. You need a partner for that startup. Who would you rather hire, Jose or Susan? How many people would hire Jose for the startup? Okay. How many people would hire Susan? All right, most of you would hire Jose. Okay. Okay. Second, second. You are in the process of organizing a fundraiser to raise money to help uh, breast cancer patients, and so you need to get somebody to help you organize that fundraiser. You know, make phone calls to plan the event and so on. Who are you going to call? Who are you going to ask to help you with that breast cancer fundraiser? Jose or Susan? How many people ask Jose? <laughs> How about Susan? OK. Third decision. You're working at the Internal Revenue Service as an auditor. And you're looking for tax evaders, people that have submitted uh, faulty, fraudulent tax returns. You can't audit everybody. And in particular, you can only audit either Jose or Susan for tax fraud. <laughs> Who would you audit? How many people would audit Jose? How many people would audit Susan? <laughs> wow. That's amazing. I can't believe how judgmental you people are. <laughs> You've never met these people, and you're making decisions about hiring and auditing and all these. How is that possible? Now, now it's true I asked you, but you didn't hesitate. You were able to make decisions like that. And there was consensus. There was consensus. Yes, I know this is Berkeley, and that's why I asked these questions. It turns out that human nature and evolution has given us cognitive abilities to make snap judgments. And from an evolutionary perspective, believe it or not, this is a feature, not a bug. But the key is, do we have enough data? Now, now, let's look at the facts here. First of all, I've listed next to each of these characteristics 
the number of broad categories that you might think of as being possible over the course of an evening's conversation into bucketing these individuals. So two major genders, two major sexual orientations. So there are four possibilities. I know there are more if you're a more complex individual. Um, marital status, you know, single, married, divorced. Race, ethnicity, there are four major races. Um, age group, you know, four major age groups, and so on. If you calculate the number of unique combinations of these features, it turns out that you've got over a million different categories. That's more resolution than a 600 by 800 photograph. But the problem is this. How many people here have met more than a million people in their lives? Nobody? I actually gave a presentation to a group of marketing people, and three people raised their hands. So I, I don't know if I believe them. So if you have not met more than 1,036,800 people, that means that some of the cells are empty in your data storage of all peoples. Because the way that we make decisions, the way that you made your snap judgments goes something like this. Of all the people that I can think of that raised money for breast cancer, how many of them look like Jose? versus how many of them look like Susan? Well, I think I'm gonna go with Susan. Of all of the people that I know that have been involved in tech startups, how many of those people look like Jose versus how many people look like Susan? I'm gonna go with Jose. So we are doing exactly what Amazon does. The problem is that our data is incredibly sparse. Most of our entries are empty. We don't have a fully populated database. Yeah? Does your analysis hold any place for baseless stereotyping? Yes, it does. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to baseless stereotyping. The reason that we have baseless stereotyping is because it doesn't take much when you've got no data to flip the bit and small things will change your impressions of entire classes of people, things, actions, and various phenomenon. That means that all of the various different biases that can emerge can emerge really easily when you've got a sparse data set and you're allowed to manipulate bits at will. This is one of the reasons why fake news is so dangerous. It doesn't take a lot to change the way you act based upon the sparse data that you currently have. And people who know that they can do enormous amounts of damage. I can do that with financial services because I know that there are certain things that you care about, like a sharp ratio. So if I show you a few graphs that give you the sense that, gee, there's not a lot of risk and huge upside, I can manipulate your data set to the point where you will easily flip from, no, I don't want to invest to, yeah, give me $100,000 of that security. Yeah. Serious question this time. Uh, I think that was the other gentleman asked. Oh. I mean, you, you, you sort of tell this story about how we as people make judgments, but the majority of the people in the room didn't raise their hands for any of your three questions. Because yes. Because the majority of us have an awareness that that's insufficient data to make a judgment. So <laughs> you're sort of telling a story about how people act, while empirically, most people in the room don't reflect the story. Well, so I, I, I'm not sure I agree with you that most people didn't raise their hands. I saw a lot of hands go up. So it was not like four or five people raised hands. So let's say maybe half the people raised their hands. OK, that's fair, right? Yeah. That's a lot of people. I mean, that's enough people to carry the vote of a particular issue. Yeah. It's a little bit like the Milgram, like the prison experiment. Right. You're in front of the room. You have a certain authority. Well, I could argue the other point, which is that there are many people that would have made the snap judgment but don't want to say and are embarrassed to say. But, but in fact, you don't have to, to reveal to me. Ask yourself, how many times have you made a snap judgment about somebody? I don't want to be his friend because you know he doesn't like soccer, and I love soccer, and so I don't want to be friends with anybody that doesn't like soccer. What a ridiculous thing to say. The person could be you know, an enormously beneficial friend to you, and yet they just don't happen to like soccer because they were hit in the head with a soccer ball when they were in fifth grade. Yeah. Uh, I do not think that the questions that you ask require these, this data. I believe that there is no data. Yes. 
Agreed. Yeah. Uh, and also, everybody has, I, I mean, people may have different weights on different parameters. That's right. That's right. It's much more complex than this, of course. But you have insufficient data, plus noisy data, and if you weigh on the noisy data, you cannot come up with good judgments, of course. Exactly. Thank you. That, that's the point. The point is that all of us, even with the ideal situation where none of your issues arise, I argue that you cannot come up with good decisions all the time. But if you now add your considerations, it is far worse. And to get back to the point about bias, one thing that I didn't talk about was path dependence, meaning that the weights on these different feature vectors are going to be different depending on your experiences. So if you were riding on the New York City subways, and you happen to be mugged by somebody that was wearing green face paint, from that day forward, when you see somebody with green face paint, you're going to think twice before being in a room with them by themselves. So it is highly path dependent. Fair, that might be a factor anyway, if I was in a room alone with someone. That, that, TMI, I, I, don't, I don't want to go there. Your example, not mine. Yeah, agreed, fine. The, the point is that in in order for us to deal with all of the foibles of human behavior, we, we need to talk about these issues. We need to think about how it is that artificial humanity can actually be modeled. So um, I won't talk a bit about what the implications are for the financial system. This is an area that I think about more often than not. But I'm going to give you one example uh, about some research that I've been doing that will give you a, a sense of where I think the future of financial AI might be. This has to do with where very specific financial behavior that I call the freak out factor. And it is nothing more complex than when the markets go down, investors can freak out. <laughs> Meaning you get scared and you decide, I can't take this anymore. I've lost 10% of the market. I got to get out. I want to put everything in cash. That's what I call freaking out. So, out. Let oh. <laughs> Well, interest rates, there are many reasons. Yeah, it could be. There are many triggers that could be uh, causing the freak out factor. So I'm focusing on the state of freaking out. It turns out that freaking out, cashing out your risky securities to put them into cash, generally is not a good thing. And in a, in a minute, I'll tell you how not a good thing it is. So in a paper that uh, I just finished with some of my students uh, and former colleagues, Daniel Elkine, Katie Kaminsky, uh, Qin Wei Xia, and Shihim Wang, we asked the question, can you predict who's going to freak out? Because if you can, you can then step in and intervene with precision indices and say, no, no, you, you're about to freak out because we just lost 10% in the stock market, interest rates uh, are down, and you're worried about the future. So I want to target you as being somebody that's likely to freak out. Can you do this? Well, it, ter it turns out you have to define what it means to freak out. So let me give you a very simple definition of freaking out. There are other definitions you come up with, but this is a simple one. Imagine that you have a portfolio at a brokerage firm, and within a month, your portfolio value declines by 90%. Now, that could be for one of two reasons. Either the market goes down by 90%, or you've liquidated part of that. Let's suppose that. The value goes down by 90%, and on top of that, you sold at least 50% of your portfolio during the month. That's what I call freaking out. Do, do we agree on that? There are less extreme versions of freaking out, but do we agree that if your portfolio balance goes down by 90%, and somewhere during the month you liquidated half of your risky holdings, that constitutes as freaking out? Okay. It turns out that we were able to get a large brokerage firm to give us data on their retail investors, about 650,000 individual accounts that spread across about 300,000 households over a 13-year period from 2003 to 2015. So this includes the financial crisis. And they gave us monthly snapshots of individual portfolios, their trading activity, and their demographics, all of this anonymized, so we don't know who they are. But we have the data. And the question that we want to ask with the data is, can we predict who freaks out? Now, first, let me show you what freakouts look like. So this graph represents the percentage of individual accounts that have freaked out in that given year. So this is year by, month by month over the course of the last 13 years. 
And you can see that there are periodic spikes. And if you overlay a graph of financial market dislocation, you can see that those spikes occur at the times when the financial crisis hit. Bear Stearns going under, Lehman going under, and so on. So clearly, people freak out. 9% of all households in our database freaks out at least once. And so the question is, does freaking out help or does it hurt? And let me show you. These are the returns of the median household that freaked out. So of, of that 9% of the households, you take that sample and you look at the median and you look at their returns one month, two, two months, three months, 10 months, 12 months after they freaked out, how do they do? Well, the returns you can see are mostly zero because they're out of the market, so they, they're not making any money. And so by and large, it seems that freaking out is actually not subtracting a lot of returns. There is one case where during the pre-crisis period, if you freak out for more than a year, that's actually not good news. You actually lose value. But by and large, it doesn't seem like you're losing anything because you're going to cash. But that's not the correct question. The correct question is, what if you didn't freak out? What would you have earned in that case? And that's this graph. This graph shows you the hypothetical portfolio. At the time you freaked out, it freezes that snapshot, and it calculates what would have happened to those securities if you had left them alone for one month, two months, three months, and so on. And you can see that the green line, which is the post-crisis period, the red line, which is the pre-crisis period, in both cases, had you left the money in instead of pulling it out, you would have actually done better. So that's what you lost in opportunity cost. But look at this. Look at the blue line. The blue line is what you would have earned had you not freaked out during the crisis. And what it shows is over an 18 to 24 month period, freaking out was actually good for you. It's actually good to freak out when, of course, you've got the right thing to freak out about. Under extreme circumstances, it doesn't cost you to get out of the market, but what does cost you is waiting too long to get back in. And therein lies the challenge. There's an opportunity there to help investors navigate around the freakout factor by helping them to get out of the market when it's extreme enough and getting back in when the coast is clear. So, to answer the question, can we identify who's going to freak out because we know it's a big issue, the answer, not surprisingly, is yes, you can. It's a little bit complicated. and Take a look at the paper if you're interested, uh, particularly because, as we said, most people don't freak out. So you can have, have a very good prediction by just assuming, yeah, you're not going to freak out. So you've got to take a balanced data set, do the usual machine learning calculations to try to balance it and be able to perform the appropriate uh, modeling. But when you do, it seems like you can actually tell who's going to freak out. So let me give you a little bit of a quiz and show you what it is that we found. I'm going to ask you to tell me who is more likely to freak out all right, of these various different characteristics. Investors who are between the ages of 45 to 85, do you think that they're more likely to freak out or less likely to freak out than typical? How many people think more? How about less? Well, it seems about even. Turns out more. Not surprisingly, the older you are, the more you have to lose, the more you're worried about retirement. So you tend to freak out more. What about females? Is there any gender difference between males and females? How many people think females are more likely to freak out? How about less likely to freak out? You're right, less likely. This is why females actually make better portfolio managers, at least in the context of retail investments. How about married investors? Are married investors likely to freak out more or less? How many people think more? How many people think less? More, more. Once you're married, one, one could argue the stakes are higher. You're thinking about a family. You've got two people that you need to think about. How about investors with self-declared excellent investment experience <laughs> knowledge? When you sign up for a brokerage account, you have to actually list your own investment experience. So these are people that are excellent investors in their own eyes, 
More, more likely to freak out? <laughs> Less likely? You're right, more likely to freak out. <laughs> Households with a larger number of dependents, more kids, more likely to freak out or less likely? More likely? Less? You're right, more. Uh, social workers, paralegals, and government-related workers, more or less likely to freak out? More likely? Less likely? Yes, you're right, less likely. And finally, self-employed real estate moguls. What do you think? More likely to freak out? Less likely? Yeah, more likely. You see where we're going with this? It turns out that with enough data, we actually have a pretty good handle on which of you is likely to overreact to certain market moves. Not only can we know who it is, but we think that we can actually predict when you're likely to do that. At what point are you likely to freak out? Here's a little teaser. It turns out that people who have done more than one trade in their account over the last 30 days has five times more likelihood of freaking out than somebody who has not done a trade in the last 30 days. So imagine if we actually had an algorithm and the data to predict who and when will freak out. And we can then intervene to prevent them from doing the thing that we know, based upon historical data, is going to give them a disadvantage in building wealth. And suppose that we allow the algorithm to manage this process entirely and program the algorithm with a goal to maximize your long-term wealth. Talk about a truly greedy algorithm. This would be it. That's what we're looking for, precision indices, right? But is greed good? We stop to ask the question, should we really be maximizing everybody's long-term wealth? Of course, that's right, right? Greed is good. Or is it? Well, let me give you one perspective. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will save not only Teldar paper, but that other dysfunctional corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. No, no applause. That, that, that's... Do, does anybody, does anybody Know where that's from? Yeah. <laughs> Turns out that in 1987, Oliver Stone released the film Wall Street featuring Gordon Gekko, the fictitious corporate raider. And interestingly enough, this character was based upon somebody, a, a number of people, but in particular that speech, that greed is good speech, was based upon a speech that was given right here at Berkeley a few years before by Ivan Bosky at the business school. Oliver Stone made this movie to illustrate to the public how disgusting and dangerous financial innovation is and how this culture of corporate greed has to be checked. And so you can imagine his consternation when years later people would talk to him, see him in a restaurant, or write him a letter saying, I want to thank you for making the movie because I became a stockbroker because of it. I became an investment banker because, of it. seriously, this movie did more for MBA programs and business schools than anything else that I could have imagined. And this is the challenge with corporate culture. It's that somehow we have lost sight of the role that ethics plays in these contexts. Now, that's not completely true. We haven't totally lost sight of it because in the financial industry, we've actually thought about this to a great extent. The role of ethics in financial transactions has actually played a very significant role in the regulations that are imposed. The way that we've dealt with how we deal with all of these various different uh, conflicts is 
the notion of fiduciary duty. A fiduciary is somebody that is required legally to put your interests in front of their own. And so it turns out that in situations where you're worried about conflicts, you have to ask the question, is the counterparty that you're dealing with, are they a fiduciary? It turns out that many brokers are not fiduciaries. So when you buy a stock from a broker at your favorite brokerage firm, they are not under legal obligation to represent your interests solely. A financial advisor, on the other hand, is. And they are held to a higher standard. So it turns out that in dealing with human interactions, we realize that we've got to deal with this in a very specific way. And so we've come up with a mechanism for doing so. Do we have that mechanism for AI? Not yet. This is part of artificial humanity as well. So it turns out that um, there actually have been discussions about this in AI, a very old one that all of you, I'm sure, know from fiction. And that is the three laws of robotics that Isaac Asimov proposed in 1942. For those handful of you that aren't nerdy enough to know what they are, let me tell you. The first law of a robot that Isaac Asimov proposed in his iRobot stories is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being come to harm. Number one rule. Number two rule, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And then the first law takes precedence. The third law says a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. So like a typical computer scientist would do, they've constructed a recursive structure, beautiful theory. But it wasn't until Isaac Asimov came to the foundation series that he developed the zeroth law. He realized that he forgot something. And the zeroth law, does anybody remember what that is? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's basically the first law of per humanity. Exactly. So Asimov realized that when you start thinking not just about individual human interactions with robots, but you're talking about the entire humanity, you need a law to cover that. And so here's what the zeroth law is. A robot may not injure humanity or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. But when he proposed the zeroth law, he didn't describe whether or not you should revise the first law to make that recursive. Let's suppose we did that. If we made the first law recursive, which means the first law, you can't injure a human, except if it conflicts with the zeroth law, well, now that raises a really interesting conundrum. It raises a conundrum that we have already dealt with as humans, which is, does it make sense to commit murder if in doing so, you save the lives of many. And what would happen if you had an AI that actually had these four laws recursively, and they started working at ExxonMobil, and started thinking about what it means for climate change, what they're doing, and for humanity? That gets really complicated. Now, I'm not smart enough to know how to think about that. But I know people in this room who are. And so I'm hoping that Shafi and her colleagues take this on to think about how ethics and culture can actually be quantified and embodied in what I call artificial humanity. So let me wrap up by saying that financial technology is not just about homo economicus. That used to be what it was about. But in my view, that's not the future of fintech. Artificial humanity. Figuring out how people actually make decisions and developing the tech to prevent us from the worst of those decisions and helping us to come up with the best, that's truly advanced AI. And you know, ethics, culture, policy, these are things that traditionally are not part of quantitative analysis. But I think they ought to be, because these issues are far too important to be just the left to philosophers politicians, and lawyers. That's the traditional domain of their expertise. But it doesn't mean that we can't take these ideas and try to start quantifying them. Otherwise, uh, the lawyers will have the final say. 
And you know, I was reminded just a, a few weeks ago about how worrisome that can be when I was told the story about a lawyer who took on a client, an elderly woman, who wanted some help with a will. And the lawyer said, the fee is uh, $100. And she said, fine. She paid him in cash, $100 bill. And then she got the advice that she needed and left. And after she left, the lawyer looked at the $100 and realized it was actually $200 bills that, were, that hadn't been separated. And so he immediately was confronted with an ethical dilemma. Should he share it with his partners? <laughs> If you didn't laugh at that joke, you need some artificial humanity. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Yes. Um, you mentioned that. Uh, um, we're using artificial intelligence, or we're, we're, we're trying to understand uh, how humans behave uh, and use artificial intelligence to uh, guide us or to uh, make the world a better place. Uh, but what if uh, com certain companies or uh, maybe governments uh, used this and understand, understood uh, humanity and how we behave um, and used their agendas to shape our opinions and shape um, our, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's the right word for it, uh, shaped our opinions so that in the future, uh, the opinions that we think that we're um, 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 adapt adapting um, are not our opinions, but the opinions that are um, uh, driven by these governments or organizations. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that that's a real danger, and that's one of the reasons why in my view, the technology field has a much broader responsibility than simply producing great products. It's because these products have system-wide societal impact that we don't fully understand. And uh, any technology, no matter what it is, can either be used or abused. And the kind of technology that's being developed right here in the Bay Area is no different. But the big difference is that the, the individuals in the policy world may not have the expertise to understand the implications of these technologies, and the people in the technology field may not feel that they should be involved in policy. And so what I'm suggesting is we need to have both come together and start thinking about these issues. And it's already happening. It's happening here. There are a number of lectures that I've seen online from the Simons Institute focusing on algorithms and the law and various kinds of challenges that technology is posing on how we govern. But I think that we need, we need smarter people to come into the field. People in this audience need to start taking these kinds of issues seriously. Thank you. Uh, yes, here and then here. Hi. Uh, now, in the financial world, your uh, system kind of ignores the fact that uh, all the actors are not independent, that they are interrelated. Yes. And, you know, in order for there to be winners, there have to be losers. So if you developed algorithms that made everyone a winner, then no one would win. Well, so let me try to challenge that perspective. In certain contexts, you're absolutely right that uh, it's a zero-sum game. But there's actually a pretty large part of finance that's not a zero-sum game. And let me give you an example, a very clear example to make this explicit. So when you buy a stock, and if it goes up, then you won. And the person who sold it to you, he was the knucklehead that lost, right? Because that person didn't participate. But that's assuming that the person was trading as opposed to trying to get liquidity. So for example, the person that sold you the stock might not be trying to trade, but trying to cash out in order to pay for his kid's college education. In which case, he doesn't mind that he's not getting the benefits of the growth in the company. He doesn't want to take any more risk. He wants to use the money to transform it from financial to educational capital. And so that's an example where typically when we think of a zero-sum game, uh, even in the context of stock market trading, it's not always a zero-sum game. But there are cases where it is. And as long as you know where it, that it is, that's fine. 
uh, two mutually consenting adults that want to engage in a particular game of chance where one loses and the other wins, that's fine, as long as they understand and can withstand those kinds of gains and losses. I would argue that for the vast majority of financial transactions, they're actually not zero-sum games. They're actually very positive gains of trade that we engage in. Because contrary to popular belief, much of the transactions that go on in financial markets is not day traders. It's people that are shifting assets from risky to riskless or riskless to risky, looking for long-term growth. And that's really how markets ultimately will provide better value for society. Yes. Oh, here's Oh, yeah. So I'm curious. Uh, I got a question about the uh, impact of artificial intelligence on financial theory. Uh, in particular, the field of artificial intelligence, the subfield I'm, I'm interested in, is uh, natural language processing. That is computers reading textual data, maybe newspapers or other, you know, n n just not numbers, like your text data. And, like, you know, I've seen in the news some recent, you know, advances in this uh, sort of technology. So I was curious how much of an influence currently this sort of natural language processing is used in you know, financial theory, whether you felt like it's going to be more involved in the near future. It's going to be, yeah. Yeah, so that's a really interesting point. Um, I would say that it hasn't really been used in financial theory, mm. but it's been used in financial data analysis. So mm -hmm. for example, some of my colleagues and I wrote a paper on looking at Twitter feeds and seeing whether or not certain patterns of text uh, can mm -hmm. actually lead to uh, changes in stock market performance mm -hmm. uh, or the minutes of, of Fed meetings. Uh, if you read those minutes for positive or negative commentary, whether or not that has any impact on the stock market. Th those kinds of methods of using natural language processing to do financial research is becoming more and more commonplace. Okay. But that's not really affecting the theory of finance yeah, I, yet. I, I, meant, I meant, I actually was talking about, I said the wrong word, but that, yeah. that, that, I, yeah. that's, that's my actual question. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And, and that's actually one of the really interesting areas in the financial industry where you traditionally had fundamental analysis that people reading uh, research reports and making decisions based upon uh, textual qualitative information. Yeah. Then you've got, on the other hand, quants that are using all of these various analytics to make decisions yeah. algorithmically. Those two are actually merging thanks to natural language processing because if you can read it and quantify it, you can actually develop an algorithm to manage it. Do you remember the name of the paper that you you mentioned? Uh, uh, it, it's on my website. Uh, I'll, I'll find it. Thank yeah, you. it's co-authored with uh, Pablo Azar, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it's on. I, I forget the exact title. Something on looking at uh, the Twitter and the wisdom of crowds. Thank you. Uh, yes, up there. So I wish Isaac Asimov was still around. I didn't know about the zeroth law. And uh, the, the uh, enormous conflict between the zeroth law and the first law. Yes. And it seems like uh, this is a little bit uh, like uh, Stalinism. How many people do you have to murder for the sake of humanity? And this is what Stalin did. Yeah. And uh, so I'm kind of interested. The first three laws were generated in 1942. At that time, uh, we were allied with Stalin. OK? And uh, so maybe it's understandable that he had that uh, mindset. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what happened uh, with that? It seems like that would be a very controversial idea. Well, it certainly is a controversial idea. And I, I obviously, I've never met uh, Dr. Asimov, so I can't speak for him. But if I had to conjecture um, how the zeroth law came to be, uh, it, it actually came out of one of the foundation uh, books that he wrote. And in the foundation, which is a, a, one of the reasons I went into economics, it's a, it's a fictional account of a mathematician named Harry Seldon, who is a psychohistorian, a field that he created, using mathematical methods to predict human behavior. But those mathematical methods only would work if the population of the planet grew to a certain size where the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem would hold. And so as part of what Asimov did that story, he had Seldon put together a set of plans for humanity that would guide it towards a very positive trajectory. But Selden also predicted that if certain other things occurred, it could actually lead the planet to a very bad outcome. And, and so he had to keep secret all of these ideas and also think about how to implement them in ways that would actually allow the higher path to be followed. And my sense is that Asimov, when he was thinking about those ideas, realized that if you want to maximize the greater good, right? 
The greatest good for the greatest numbers, that's the typical utilitarian philosophy that uh, John Stuart Mills and other utilitarians espoused. The greater good for the greater number leads, in some cases, to necessary deaths, as difficult as it is for us to acknowledge. Uh, the classic example is the trolley problem. I don't want to bore you with a lecture on ethics, but you know the old you know, trolley's going down a path, six people are going to get killed, one person on the other side of the track. If you flip the switch, one person dies, not six. Do you want to do that? Those kind of calculations, it turns out we do this all the time. We, we do this now. For example, when we set the speed limit in the United States to 55 miles an hour, that means a certain number of people will die every year. If instead you set the speed limit to 45 miles an hour, you will save lives. So why not do that? Well, because we want to get to work on time. And we don't want to drive 45 miles an hour on the freeway. And so we as a society have decided the trade-off between a life and getting to work. And, and if you think I'm joking about this, take a look at the Department of Transportation. On their website is a memo on the statistical value of a life. And that number, $9.1 million, that's the value that they use to assign to your life, my life, in calculating speed limits in order to balance cost and benefit. So we do this right now. And if we're going to develop truly powerful AI, the AI is going to have to do this on our behalf. And the question is, how? So th that's the troubling thing with the, the four laws of robotics. Uh, oh. Very quickly, just not to miss the lesson of Asimov, the AI that Asimov developed committed suicide because it couldn't resolve that dilemma between the zeros and first law. So <laughs> not to like forget what he did. Yeah. Which is, which is not a great outcome, but you know, I, I, that, I, that actually could be the optimal outcome you know, <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Uh, uh, yes, maybe uh, back there, and then we'll go back down here. I, I'm uh, wondering uh, about like the line between uh, wants and needs uh, for the AI and financial decisions. Like, say, if I wanted to uh, liquidate my portfolio to buy a boat, that seems like a pretty bad idea. And so, like, uh, an ethical AI might prevent me from doing that. But me as like a human being might really enjoy like being out in the ocean, um, and so it seems like there's like a line of where it's like a really bad ethical decision that someone should prevent you from making, yeah. or they should allow it. Right. So this is exactly where the issues are going to arise, and where we have to think about how much paternalism we want to instill in our AI, and how much we want to allow individuals to override these recommendations. My guess is that initially there's going to be a lot of overriding of these kinds of suggestions. But eventually, if the AI gets good enough and ends up knowing you better than you know yourself, if that ever happens, I know it seems kind of crazy. But let me give you one example of how good AI is. So I, I, I enjoy playing chess on chess.com. I'm not very good at it. But I've done these exercises where not only do I not get the right answers for the exercises, I can't even understand what the answers are when I'm told what they are. Because the, the chess program is going five, six, seven steps ahead. I can barely look two steps ahead. And so, but I now have confidence that the AI is better than I am. Even though I can't understand it, I believe that the AI is better than I am. What if we get to a point where financial AI knows a lot more about what's going to happen in the stock market next year, what's going to happen with macroeconomic conditions, what's going to happen with your own personal conditions, your health. What if they factor all of that in? And like a chess engine, they just know so much more than you do that you know, buying that, that surfboard or whatever you want is going to cause you tremendous grief in three years' time. And you don't even know it. Might we ever get there? Exactly. That's right. So, but, but, as, a, as somebody who would parrot a computer scientist, I would say it's just a matter of degree. It's not a matter of different characteristic. Uh, you know, checkers is now a completely solved problem. We actually know what the optimal strategy for chess is from beginning to end. That was solved about 10 years ago. <laughs> checkers, finite, checkers, not chess, checkers. Systems which are chaotic and you cannot invisibly on 
th that's right. And so there may be a residual amount of uncertainty that we will never be able to get to, but never is a long time. And I, I don't know how much technology is needed to be able to deal with that situation. And remember, you don't need an AI that's perfect. You just need an AI that's better than you. And the question is, how long does it take for us to get an AI that's better than you? With chess, we're already there. When you look at Herbert Simon, I, I, I wish Simon were alive today because he would just be blown away that Garry Kasparov cannot even understand some of these chess moves. When Garry Kasparov says, oh, that's a computer move, I don't know what that is, that's amazing to me. So might we get there with financial AI? I think we can, but it may take another 20 or 30 years. But I think we can get there. With the people in this room, I think we can get there. Uh, yes, down here, question. And, and then. Um, in light of what you just said, how should financial regulation evolve uh, for this incoming, and I'm quoting the one recent issue of The Economist, um, an, an avoidable uh, AI takeover of financial services? Thank you. Well, for one thing, I believe that financial regulators need to learn more computer science. They need to hire more computer scientists, and they are, believe it or not. The SEC has actually been hiring people that are, are data scientists and understand uh, uh, how these AI systems are working. And I believe that actually, by using these techniques, regulators can do a better job of regulating. They can regulate much more efficiently by using technology. They're not there yet, but they're getting there. More importantly, I think eventually, we're going to have to think seriously about how we uh, digitize our legal uh, interactions. And I know that uh, Frank Partnoy and Shafi uh, are teaching a, a course on algorithm and the law. So it's happening now. But most lawyers are not computer scientists. They're not even trained in, in computing. So I think that that's really where we need to make the biggest change, which is to start thinking about the law and our interactions of the law as something that can actually be understood algorithmically. It, it shouldn't be hard. Uh, and there's some really interesting conundrums. It, there's one story that I have to tell because Shafi and other computer scientists are here. So it turns out that uh, in the 1940s at the Institute for Advanced Study, I think it was 1940s, um, Kurt Gödel, the famous logician, uh, happened to be uh, there. And he was about to take a test for citizenship. And as part of the citizenship test, you're going to get asked questions about the Constitution. And so he had to read the Constitution. And, and he spent a lot of time reading it. And so the day came for him to go to the judge. In those days, it was, you had to see a judge, and the judge would ask you questions. And so um, Gödel didn't know how to drive, so he needed to be driven. So he got a ride from, believe it or not, Albert Einstein and I think it was von Neumann, the two of them. This is the absolutely true story. You can read it in Who Got Einstein's Office. It's a book that was published decades ago. So they gave him a ride. And along the way, Gödel said something interesting. He said, you know, I read the Constitution. And I realized something. It is possible in a completely legal way to turn this country into a dictatorship. The Constitution allows it. And I have an algorithm that will do that. <laughs> and now this was right in the middle of the Cold War. And so. You know, Einstein and Barnum says, no, 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 no. You do not want to mention this. At, 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 when the judge asks you, what do you think about Stalin and the dictatorship, you do not want to say, oh, that could happen here, too. And so you know, I wonder you know, if we had Shafi and Silvio McCauley and some of the other Turing Award winners read our Constitution or read corporate governance documents, what kind of things would they find? And what would be possible? What could computer scientists tell us? about legal interactions and governance that we don't know, I, I think, quite a lot. Start with terms of service. What's that? Start with terms of service. Terms of service. Uh, other, yeah, here. Oh, and then back here. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, thank you for the motivating speech. Um, I just want to ask, uh, this is not about ethics. It's more about emotional reaction to different uh, situations of like human nature. So what if uh, we get to a day where, uh, no matter by AI or by other means, or by like psychology or neuroscience, we can fully exploit this human nature, and we can fully understand the patterns of human emotional reaction to everything around us? Will there be such a day, or will human nature 
uh, our pattern of emotional reaction to the outer world also evolve with our knowledge of this world? Yeah, there's no doubt that human behavior will evolve to deal with these technologies. Whether or not you can predict how they evolve, I think you can. And so I believe that there is eventually our ability to be able to make certain kinds of forecasts that will allow us to compute equilibria uh, between the various different species that are co-evolving. I, I, maybe there are chaotic components of the system that you'll never be able to forecast, uh, but there is a significant enough element and a significant enough regularity in human behavior that you can go pretty far along the way. Uh, there's an enormous amount of potential right now, and I think it's just really a, a field that's beginning to, to get off the ground with uh, you know, people in neuroscience collaborating, people in computer science and engineering. There's just so many things that, that are, are able to be done uh, that, that don't fit into any one single field. That's kind of the, the, the fun of an organization like the Simons Institute. It, it's not just for computer scientists. There are all sorts of interesting people here, and many schools are starting up various different computer science uh, uh, colleges, uh, if you will. Uh, so I think that um, there's a lot more that, uh, that can be done. Uh, yeah, one more. Is it Shafi, did you? Oh, okay, uh, over here. Thank you for the talk. Um, so uh, I agree with you. AI is going to be probably the best investor out there. There's probably going to be multiple AIs, right? Uh, because of the amount of data, because of Moore's law, because they're able to process things much better than us humans. So the question for you is, is the end state AI trading with AI? And are we not going to have any human investors around at the end? Are we just going to be, at the end, the customers of an AI investors uh, that are doing all the work for us? You know, I think that that might be possible, although I think it's going to take us a very long time for the simple reason that the complexity of the investment process suggests that there will always be a group of individuals that are going to be able to provide unique services to individual investors that are seeking those services. So I don't mean things like index funds. Index funds are already now pretty much run by AI. I mean, you know, the portfolio optimizers that can construct an S&P index fund, they can do that you know, at the blink of an eye. You don't need to worry about a lot of oversight on the management of those portfolios. But I'm thinking about you know, hedge fund strategies where somebody says, I want to look for unique opportunities in the energy field. You know, when we have a discovery of a, a particular kind of energy technology, I want to invest in that. I think that those are still going to require human oversight. Uh, but more and more now, I think it's going to be a partnership between technology and human judgment that will be able to make those kinds of decisions. And, and in the end, I, I really think that's what technology does. It, it's not necessarily going to be replacing humans altogether, but it, it's going to change the domain over which we uh, spend our time and uh, you know, add value to an investment process. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.